This is Dale with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today we're asking the question, how do you use SDRs for cheetah conservation? To answer that question, today we have with us Anne Schmidt-Kunzel of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Anne, what can you tell me about the organization? Well, um, so we are definitely working a lot with microsatellites. Um, I joined the organization seven years ago to set up a genetics laboratory in the middle of nowhere. Um, Help in me. Where, where is the middle of nowhere? <laughs> um, we are 40 kilometers from the closest town. We are off the grid. Uh, so generator power, backup battery systems, um, solar energy, etc. Um, you know, three and a half hours to the capital. Of Namibia. Of, of Namibia, which has only two million and some inhabitants. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the, the laboratory now is functioning. And so um, that's where we then work with microsatellite mostly to identify cheetahs, um, individuals. And so that is something that, well, you, you, you do if you want to do genetic work on them, but also in our case, because we work mostly with scat samples, so with fecal samples, we really don't know which individual the fecal sample belongs to. And so we do genetic analyses and identify the animal with three to four microsatellites to begin with. And then, um, and then as we have, then we, we determine how many individuals are in our sample collection. Um, and that's then the first step of genetics. And then we, 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 we combine that with all of our other conservation efforts, uh, looking at follow-up questions in biomedical research. And so this is a population genetics effort where you're collecting thousands of samples, is that correct? Yes, so it's not exactly. So the, from the genetic point of view, we're definitely interested in population genetics, interested in seeing, you know, when there's an area where there were no cheetahs before and we get cheetahs now, we get some samples, usually very few from those areas, to find out where those animals came from, you know, whether they're very isolated from neighboring areas, etc. So, so kind of the, the classic conservation genetics, population genetics questions. Um, the structure itself. So working there seven years ago and setting up the lab, it must have been pretty difficult to get going. It's challenging, um, you know, when you get something, especially being used to working in the United States before, where you order something and it's on your bench the next day, um, it can take weeks or months for us to get something, so you definitely have to plan ahead. And then it's always the fear of things breaking down, because obviously we can't you know, we don't have laboratories next door that can help us, so we, are, we have to be self-sufficient, um, which obviously doesn't work if you don't get good help. And so we have a um, very, very strong connection to your colleagues in South Africa who are always, you know, right on the spot, answering our emails um, right away, very fast, giving us advice and helping us to what we can do to help determine what the problem is so then they can guide us. Um, so we have very, very good support from there. And as far as then recently, you were able to upgrade your system, is that correct? Yes. So we, um, for us, that's a big, big difference. So we um, started off with a 310, just really mostly to see whether it was feasible. So it was quite a big challenge. Um, and since that worked really well and we used it intensely, we then um, were lucky enough to get support from you and obtain a 3130, which for us means quadrupling our throughput, um, which is makes a big difference for our day-to-day -day laboratory work. Yes. And what can you tell me about the conservation efforts overall in terms of the success of that effort? So, so of course, um, so what starts with our genetics, as I said, then continues. So we are a multidisciplinary um, research team at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And so that includes ecology, that includes um, medic, well, veterinary work um, and human wildlife conflict resolution um, because obviously we want to study the cheetahs but we want them to stay alive and that involves working with people and making sure they can live together with the cheetahs. So farmers training, um, livestock guarding dogs to protect the cheetahs um, and then go, you know, going back to the, the um, biomedical research and maybe to the samples that start with us in the laboratory they follow a track that we first identify them genetically, and then we do follow up questions with hormone levels to see stress levels of the animal, to see dominance of males, cycles of females, parasite levels, just looking at egg counts in the feces, 
Um, and also the diets. We can look at hairs under the microscope, what the imprint of the hairs to determine what, what the cheetah had eaten. Um, so it's a really whole complex um, approach that, that, we, that we take in general at the Cheetah Conservation Funds. And I understand you're also uh, involved in lots of collaborations with the Smithsonian here in D.C., with the National Cancer Institute. Yes, so the, the, the collaborations are, of course, very important to us. Uh, we, for example, the hormone work we don't do on site at this point, and so we have been working with the reproductive physiology team in Front Royal that is part of the Smithsonian um, for a long term time, uh, working on so the hormone work, but also I think the most important part was to see how you can bank sperm in a field setting, um, which has been optimized, and so we have a, a sperm database um, sample collection uh, on site with, which is very important to preserve the diversity of the cheetahs um, you know, for, forever, well, for as long as possible and so um, in case the, the diversity is more reduced in the future. And I understand there's a connection even with the Middle East. There is. And so we have been working very closely with the United Arab Emirates um, because there is a problem that people aren't really familiar with, which is that the cheetah is faced with illegal trade as well. Um, and although that's not, you know, ivory where you kill the animal to obtain something, in the case of the cheetah, it's mostly pet trade. So Peter, people love the cheetah so much that they want them at home and that they buy them from illegal places who go into the wild and then deplete the wild populations. And so we then look at two things. On the one side is, you know, looking at the genetics of them to see where they came from, so the forensic side. Um, and then also, you know, to preserve the genetic diversity for the future, we have gone over there um, with Dr. Laurie Marker and collected sperm and banked it and started the Genome Resource Bank with cheetah sperm in the UAE for them um, and hope they will keep contributing to it. Yeah. And I also understand that there is training opportunities. What can you tell me about that? Yes. Yeah, so, so we have... Um, First, training is very important. We are, you know, in a country in a, in a country with a small population, where training opportunities are quite limited, and so we also see it as our responsibility to provide training and um, contribute as much as we can to that country where, where we live in and work in. And so, for example, the genetics laboratory always has one or two Namibian interns who then learn the ropes and learn, you know, the, the good laboratory practices, etc., and analyses, um, and then. My favorite story is that my very first intern then stayed with us, did a master with us, which she just handed in end of last year and is now my laboratory technician and um, research assistant. So, um, my, and so she's now helping me train the next interns that are coming through. And I understand you also have postdoctoral opportunities in terms of visiting fellows? Yes, so we have, so we had, for instance, last year, a researcher from the Smithsonian who came um, to look at an, a disease that might have a genetic component, amyloidosis, and did some genetic work in our laboratory. And we always welcome international researchers to come and do the genetics work in our laboratory if they're interested in studying something that involves Namibia. And we um, actually really would like to encourage that as opposed to people taking samples and, you know, taking them out of the country and then having... Um, lucky grad students in the U.S. and Europe being able to work on that and nothing benefiting Namibia really. So we think that if possible people, you know, there is the possibility to do laboratory work, genetic work in Namibia. So if work is done in Namibia, I mean, we'd welcome anyone to come. Um, yeah, and they can combine that with a Namibia safari. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, I understand from your Facebook page at CCF Cheetah uh, that they were inviting people to think of visiting Yes, definitely. I mean, you know, we do um, have a, a great research center, informative research center, uh, where people can come and visit and see the setup, learn about the cheetah, um, you know, and the challenges it faces. Um, but I mean, also, we, we like to highlight Namibia. It's an amazing country, and it is not for nothing called the cheetah capital of the world. You know, a third of the whole cheetah population lives in Namibia. And so it's really a country worth highlighting where there are challenges like everywhere, but there are really a lot of very good things, um, especially in terms of conservation, and um, that I think is worth for people to discover and learn more about. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for taking the time today.
Certainly, if you want more information, check out the Cheetah Conservation Fund's website at cheetah.org. Also, their Facebook page at facebook.com slash ccfcheetah. And also, stay tuned here to Behind the Bench for further updates about this important work.